It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. 1 John 1 9 states, If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we've forgotten. Therefore, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege, opportunity, and freedom to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the word of God into our souls, in whose name we pray, amen. We've been studying Satan's strategy, and Satan has a strategy also regarding Israel and the divine attitude toward Satan or the divine attitude toward anti-Semitism is actually given in Genesis 12.3. Turn in your Bibles to Genesis 12.3. The divine attitude toward anti-Semitism given very early on in the Bible. And ever since the divine attitude was made known, Satan's attitude has been different, counterfeit, opposite, why? Satan's rebellious. Satan is rebellious against God. Everything God says that is so, Satan says, no, it's not so, and I'll prove it. And that's the way anti-authority people always function. Oh, is that so? That is not so. I will prove authority wrong. Authority in the human realm is often wrong, but it's still authority. And people in this country do not understand authority whatsoever. And a nation that does not understand authority goes into the five cycles of discipline. It's inevitable. God sets up authority for one reason and one reason only. Our freedom. Genesis chapter 12 verse 3. I will bless those who bless you. Bless who? The Jew. I will bless those who bless the Jew. But the one who curses the Jew or despises the Jew, I will curse. And through you, all the races on the earth shall be blessed. That's prophetic, referring to the fact that when Jesus Christ dies on the cross as a substitute for us, which he's already done, all the nations have been blessed through that. Meaning there are believers all throughout the world. And probably all the nations at least most. So I will bless those who bless you. But the one who curses or despises you, I will curse. And through you, Abraham, the races, individuals, and nations, the earth shall be blessed. And today we see a marked rise in anti-Semitism, an extreme rise. Ever since the war on terror started, it has been rising ever since. So anti-Semitism could be a person who's anti-Semitic. Could be a group that's anti-Semitic. Could be an organization or even a nation that's hostile to the Jews. Today it's the world to the exclusion of a little more than half of Americans. And that's it. The whole world hates the Jew and hates the nation Israel except for a little more than half of Americans. How did that happen? Satanic propaganda. Satanic propaganda is exactly how this happened. Let me give you some satanic propaganda that I heard on the news and got a copy of it because I'm that good. <laughs> Here's a copy of it. Former President... Jimmy Carter is attacking America again. I didn't write this. This is from someone else. Uh, it's uh, from some press. I can't. Uh, I didn't write it down. Probably should have. But anyway, former President Jimmy Carter is attacking America again. 
This time, Carter is undermining the United States in an interview to a foreign publication. We used to call that something in America. Treason. In an interview with the German news publication, Der Spiegel, and that's correctly translated, I used to take German, Der Spiegel, Carter, re not translated, but uh, it's properly pronounced, Carter repeatedly criticized the United States. A former president went to a former country and criticized the United States on foreign soil, as well as Israel. This is Carter, quote, With the United States supporting and encouraging in, in Israel in its unjustified attack on Lebanon. You read that right. Carter says Israel was wrong to respond to the attacks against Israel by the terrorist group Hezbollah. In a previous interview, Carter had said that the world community should rally behind Israel's other enemy the terrorist group Hamas. Carter called for and succeeded in getting the United States government to give money to Hamas. In his recent interview Carter criticized the United States for the war on terrorism. Quote, Our country always had a policy of not going to war unless our own security was directly threatened. Then the, then the piece goes on to say, Shame on you, Mr. Carter! How dare you ignore the fact that the United States has been directly threatened by Islamic terrorists. They attacked our nation on 9-11. They attacked the U.S. naval vessel, the USS Cole. They've bombed so many of our embassies around the world that it's hard to keep track. They've kidnapped, take, kidnapped, taken hostage, and murdered American civilians left and right. But President Carter, who appeared, who appeased, excuse me, but President Carter, who appeased the Islamic terrorists during his presidency, is now once again undermining the U.S. fight against Islamic terrorism. And he's doing it with interviews with the foreign press, condemning his own nation to the people of other nations. Treason! In an attempt to rally world opinion against the United States and Israel. Jimmy Carter is a believer. Jimmy Carter has believed in Christ. But he definitely doesn't understand Genesis chapter 12 verse 3. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And all the nations of the world will be blessed through you. This used to be our president. Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. Again, it's treasonous. Anti-Semitism can be uh, explained this way or defined this way. Anti-Semitism is hatred. Hatred. Almost got uh, Pentecostal. Hatred. <laughs> Anti-Semitism is hatred. Intolerance. Prejudice. Opposition. Persecution and violent opposition to the Jewish race. Revelation chapter 12 will detail the future of anti-Semitism during the tribulation. One day we'll study Revelation. If the resurrection doesn't occur first and if we're still here. Revelation 12 details the future of anti-Semitism Anti-Semitism is hatred, intolerance, prejudice, opposition, persecution, and violent opposition to the Jewish race. Satan has two major objectives in his strategy of anti-Semitism. It is a satanic strategy, and it is a strategy that has gotten believers, such as Jimmy Carter, to follow him. This is evil, and we will study today how Satan's strategy is evil. His own policy is a policy of evil. 
again we have a contradiction what is God's policy toward us what's po God's policy toward us grace grace is God's policy toward us what's Satan's policy evil grace is what what God does for us evil is what what we think we can do for ourselves through human good what Satan can do for us through his good it's what people can do for themselves that becomes evil and uh, there, we're going to find out that there's a lot of people for example who die pass away and the preacher gives, gets up and he talks about all the human good that person ever performed or most of it or all that he thinks is important the person was a good father this person worked very hard this person did this and that this person helped the poor and that person may have been totally evil and people praise evil people because they've fallen under Satan's satanic system his historical objective in the beginning was to keep our Lord Jesus Christ from going to the cross which is what we studied on Friday you had to suffer through a nosebleed with me you couldn't see it but it was draining the other way so his historical objective was to keep Jesus Christ from going to the cross that strategy failed of course his prophetical objective. Now again, point one, his historical objective. This is important to get the categories. Point one, his historical objective was to keep our Lord Jesus Christ from going to the cross. That was his historical objective. His prophetical objective is to destroy Israel. Why? And when I say Israel, I'm not talking about the present day Israel. Present day Israel could be destroyed. We're talking about descendants of Abraham. They will never be wiped out. While Israel could be wiped out today, and a lot of Christians would uh, say, oh, that's not possible. Yes, it is. Israel today is not a client nation. It is a nation with Jews and Arabs and Christians all intermingled. And not all Jews live in Israel. I don't really know the statistics, but I know a lot of Jews live in the United States. I'm not sure if more Jews live in the United States than in Israel, but if more Jews lived here than in Israel, it wouldn't shock me. All you have to do is go to New York City. You don't even have to go there. You probably work with a Jew or know a Jew somewhere, even in the South where uh, most of the Jewish population exists in the Northeast. But uh, you probably know a Jew here in America. Why? It's a safe haven for the Jews and they are not persecuted as of yet for being Jews. And that's a good thing. So the prophetical objective is to destroy Israel so that the four condition, unconditional covenants cannot be fulfilled at the second advent. This is Satan's thought. If I can wipe out the Jew then there will never be an Israel in the millennium. Well, that's correct, Satan. If you could wipe out all the Jews, if you could, through your violence, murder every single Jew, then you'll make God out to be a liar. But he can't do it. He tries. Why is there such a rise in anti-Semitism? He is constantly trying to kill, murder, through violence, all Jews. This should all wake all of you up to the fact that the angelic conflict is right here before our eyes. When you flick on the news, what do you see? Angelic conflict! When you go through your daily life, you should be thinking, I'm in a conflict. I'm in an angelic conflict. It's not a time to be depressed. It's not a time to be worried about your silly superficial things in life. You've got to start understanding we're in a greater conflict! Just flick on the news and you'll see it. You'll see the whole thing playing out right before your eyes. And while sometimes you might get frustrated and sad at all the stuff that's happening, I kind of look at it and say, there's God's promises. There's the whole Bible unfolding for me right there on television, even though it's the church age. But even in the church age, Satan's always going to try to wipe out the Jew. That's his stated policy. 
From the time God wrote Genesis chapter 12 verse 3 through Moses, from the time God made that statement, Satan has been against it. He's anti-authority. And from that time forward, Satan's strategy has been to wipe out the Jew. And somebody, some atheist, some stupid atheist may say, you prove to me there's a God. Well, there's no way they can see spiritually all the things going on, but we can see the footprints of God everywhere. We can see the footprint. The we can see the. Uh, it's almost like the deer tracks of the angelic conflict. It's like going down to the lake and you look at the beach and you see a deer track and you say a deer's been here. Well, you flick on the news and you see anti-Semitism and you say Satan's been around here. Yep. For us, it's clear. For us, we can see it. For the unbeliever, it's impossible. They cannot spiritually discern these things. We can. And that should be a phenomenal thing. It shouldn't depress you, really. It should make you excited to know, hey, I'm on the right side. And it should make you realize all this stuff that I'm preaching is true. Absolutely true. And all the stuff in the Bible is true. Amen. Mm -hmm. And when... Um, and when you, uh, well, I was going to go off onto something, but I was stopped. Okay, so Satan has two major objectives. His historical objective, objective, and his prophetical objective. Now, there's a correlation between the fall of nations and their attitude toward the Jew. I had a history book in high school that actually delineated the historical correlation between the attitude of the nations toward the Jew and their historical rise and fall. A history book! I don't know who wrote it, but it was somebody with a lot of discernment. Believer or not, I doubt it. I doubt they were a believer, but they had come to correlate through history, just being a student of history, that uh, certain nations, when they became a haven for the Jew, were blessed. And when nations went against the Jew, they were cursed. And you can look all through history and see that. Now, I love history. Some people might not like it, but I love it because you can look back in history and see the angelic footprints all over it. And as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ with some doctrine, you can really have some capacity for history. Because you can look at the rise of Spain and the fall of Spain and you can see where they started not anti-Semitic and they ended anti-Semitic. And you can see the rise of Prussia. What's Prussia? Not Russia, Prussia. Where's Prussia? Germany. It's situated uh, about the place of Germany, at least eastern Germany, into parts of Poland is where Prussia was located. Prussia was pro-Semitic the Germanic people at one time were pro-Semitic. So they rose. Prussia rose as a nation actually became a client nation for a short period. Then who came on the scene later in Germany? Adolf Hitler. And they went from pro-Semitism to anti-Semitism and why not? You see what happened a lot of Jews got concentrated in Prussia. Why? It started out as a haven. So all the Jews scattered throughout the earth as part of their five cycles of discipline, still scattered throughout the earth today, a lot of them started to make their immigration into a place called Prussia, modern-day Germany. And they got there, and Prussia began to have an extraordinarily large, the largest Jewish population ever. Satan took a look at that said there's a great concentration of Jews in this one area. So out from the dust and out from the uh, failed artistry came somebody named Adolf Hitler. He tried to be an artist but he failed. He failed at everything he did. He was a loser. Everything he did he failed at. But then he became possessed. Demon or satanic. Either way. One or the other probably satanic and he and that and then that occurred and guess what 
that huge population of Jews right there in Germany, six million of them, annihilated. Satan! So Prussia went from pro-Semitism, then they declined and went into anti-Semitism. And uh, what happened to Germany in anti-Semitism? Rubble. In World War II, they turned into rubble. Rubble. Oh, they talk about the damage an atomic bomb can do. We dropped so many bombs on uh, Germany. It's far greater than what uh, happened in Japan, really. Because if you, during the time, every single city, every single, every single major city in Germany was brought to rubble. Rubble. Hospitals, churches, anything. Oh, we didn't do this discriminant bombing that we do today. Like, well, we can't hit a mosque, we'll hit this. Nope. We had the B-2 or whatever they call them, those big flying fortresses with their props. We had them fly over and drop bomb after bomb and just level the place. And we leveled Germany. For some odd reason we re rebuilt it, but that's a whole other story. But at that time, we leveled Germany. And that is what happens to nations that go into anti-Semitism. And I thank God we haven't gone that route yet. Yet. You just have one president get into power who's anti-Semitic and you'll see what will happen to this country. Our country may be destroyed before we even have a next president. You think about that. It could happen. We might not have till tomorrow. By the way, August 22nd is a huge date for the Muslims. Huge date. And... Uh, they may do nothing. They may just be barking. They do that a lot. They bark like dogs a lot and never do a thing. But tomorrow is a huge day for the Muslims. Just to let you know. Anyway, I'm not a prophet, so... Satanic strategy is to discredit believers by involving them in the satanic cosmic system. Now, Satan, now again, we need to get the... Uh, title for what we're about to study. The title is this, the next portion. We're finished with anti-Semitism for a moment. The next portion. Satan has a strategy against the believers in the church. Satan has a strategy against believers and the church. He definitely has a strategy against us. And some of Satan's strategy will include the following. Before we get there, just a little note that I watched on the news today. I don't know if it's true or not, but uh, one of the former lovers of Osama bin Laden said that Osama bin Laden had a major crush on Whitney Houston. No, I'm being serious. It's funny. But uh, one of the former lovers of Osama bin Laden's written a book. Whether it's true, maybe she's just trying to make money. We don't know if what she written is true or not, but I thought it funny just to hear this that uh, he had a major crush on Whitney Houston, even though he's racist, racist and doesn't like black people. And also, uh, she wrote that he actually had plans to get rid of her husband so he could be with her. I could believe that, but uh, that's something for the tabloids, I guess. Could be true. Could be for the tabloids, probably. But Satan has a strategy against believers. Number one, Satan's strategy is to discredit the canon of Scripture. Satan's strategy is to discredit the canon of Scripture, especially those who put an emphasis on the mystery doctrine of the church age. Satan is here to discredit the mystery doctrine of the church age. And the best way for Satan to discredit the mystery doctrine of the church age is for believers to get them eyes, their eyes on themselves and other people and for believers to go into an anti-authority mode. We live in a nation that is anti-authority from top to bottom. People may show an interest in the word, but when they're anti-authority, it ruins it. It's out the window. And the Apostle Paul had to write to Timothy and he had to make it clear to Timothy. Timothy, you are the authority 
Timothy, do not let your congregation despise you because of your youth. Timothy, stop drinking only water, have a glass of wine, and chew their asses out. Basically, he didn't say that verbatim. It's recorded in Scripture as, Timothy, stop drinking water only, but drink some wine for thy stomach's sake. Is that better? But the fact is, the problem with Timothy was he was being run over by women in the church. And the authority that had been given to him, well, the Apostle Paul had to make it straight. You have, you've been given authority. Use it! Exercise it! Stop worrying! But I lose so many people. So what? what Paul would have told him. He basically did. You need to straighten these Corinthians out. You need to straighten these people out. Stop sitting around. Show them who's boss. And don't let them despise you because you're young. Show them who is boss. Why? Authority is one of the most important systems God ever set up. Authority is what Satan went against. And when a pastor stands up and preaches, he is the authority. If you don't like it, I've said it many times and I'll say it again, you can get the hell out. But I've had people say, you can't say that. I can say whatever the hell I want. This is authority and I'm not going off the beaten path because Satan had a problem with authority. And anyone who has a problem with any type of authority, right or wrong, I'm not saying I'm always going to be right. I'll be wrong sometimes. Or I'm going to make sure I'm right on the doctrine. And if I mix it up somehow, I'm going to make sure I clarify it. But in terms of some decisions I may make, I may be wrong. So what? That's authority. When you're given authority, you're to use it. Just like in Texas, they have the death penalty and they use it. Well, when you have authority, you use it. People think you shouldn't. Not in our sensitive, hypersensitive culture that is so satanically influenced, we're not going to make it. We can't fight wars. We're too hypersensitive. We can't do anything. We're a paper tiger. We're falling apart. And the only thing people do, instead of seeing the angelic footprints and the angelic uh, conflict when they turn on the news, the only thing they do is suck in all the uh, demon activity and believe whatever Dan Rather or Peter Jan oh, he's dead, or whatever uh, Dan Rather or whoever else is on television says. And whatever they say, that's what they believe. Peter Jennings. He did die, right? I think he smoked and got cancer of the lungs. If he'd only listened to Bill Clinton. Say to satanic uh, Satan has a strategy here. And that and this is the next strategy. Satanic strategy is to encourage rejection of Bible doctrine. Satanic strategy is to encourage rejection of Bible doctrine and to bypass and ignore post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation. Satanic strategy is to encourage rejection of Bible doctrine and to bypass and ignore post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation. And how does Satan do that? By emphasizing your experience, by emphasizing your human good and your human evil by titillating and scratching you behind your ear and saying what a good Christian you are when you're a failure. That's Satan's strategy. So satanic strategy is to hinder and distract believers from the execution of the unique spiritual life. Satan tries to distract from post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation in the following way. And we will have some principles here. Again, the title, Satan Tries to Distract the Believer from Post-Salvation Epistemological Rehabilitation, P-S-E-R, in the following ways. And there will be six principles 
This is how he distracts you or even gets you to go completely negative. Number one. Through negative volition toward the teaching of the Word of God and Bible doctrine. Number one. Through negative volition toward the teaching of the Word of God and Bible doctrine. Again, through negative volition toward the teaching of the Word of God and Bible doctrine. Number two. Through getting the believer out of fellowship so that there is no filling of God the Holy Spirit. By getting the believer out of fellowship so that there is no filling of God the Holy Spirit. The power option of the spiritual life. First power option. Through getting the believer out of fellowship so that there is no filling of God the Holy Spirit. And many people have sat in Bible classes for 30 years, yet they've been out of fellowship so long, they or most of the time, that they really don't understand what they're hearing. They're out of fellowship. And just because people show up and listen for years and years and years, if you're always out of fellowship, it doesn't matter. You see, you might say, well, I'm doing Operation Z. You cannot do Operation Z without the first power option, the filling of the Spirit. And people are not filled with the Spirit because they have a glitch. What is that glitch? Self-justification, self-deception, and self-absorption. They are arrogant. And their glitch is anti-authority. Their glitch is, I have a right to be anti-authority. Their glitch is, I'm right, you're wrong. I'm always right, you're always wrong. And when you have a glitch like that, you'll never learn anything of Bible doctrine because Bible doctrine steps on everyone's toes and when it steps on your toes, you can either say, you're right, God, and rebound, or you can say, I don't like what I'm hearing and I'm going to cause a scene. And if you don't like what you're hearing and you cause a scene, you're an arrogant SOB and you are under the cosmic system and you are out of fellowship and you'll never make it. You're a loser. You say, but I listen. You can listen until the cows come home. If you're not filled with the Spirit, it doesn't matter. And I have known people who have listened to Colonel Theme and have listened to Doctrine for 50 years and obviously there's been a glitch because they have absorbed nothing into their souls and they are full of legalism, full of arrogance, full of telling people how to live their lives, full of saying, if I see you smoke a cigarette, I'll shove it down your throat. What kind of person, after listening to Bible doctrine for 50 years, would say that? The kind of person who has never been filled with God the Holy Spirit, or if he or she has, it has been for a very short amount of time and not long enough for them to grow up. You see, it is God the Holy Spirit who is our mentor and our teacher. Without it, we're nothing. Without it, we're nothing. No one under... No one seems to get it. A few people do, but hardly anyone seems to understand the fact that they're not filled with the Spirit. Why don't they understand? No filling of God the Holy Spirit. None. And they, oh, they'll claim, oh, I listen, I listen every day. Oh, they, they really, they may put the tape on or put on the MP3 and they may let it rattle on for an hour but where's their mentor and their teacher and the one who brings to their remembrance, remembrance those things that are forgotten? Not there. And why not? Well, they're too busy thinking about something else. They're too busy brooding over something else that happened during the day. Probably too mad at their husband or wife. That's one of the biggest problems in Christendom today. Husband and wife get in fights all the time. Therefore, neither of them are filled with the Spirit. They're too busy jabbing each other in the back. Yet they both listen every day. Where's it gotten them? Nowhere. They have a glitch. They've left out the first power option, the filling of the Spirit. And I can never overemphasize the importance of the filling of the Spirit. And do you know why people in America have a hard time and around the world being filled with the Spirit? Lack of humility. Lack of humility. What do they do? When they sin, I'm not going to name it, I was right self-justification. And then they even come to believe themselves that they were right. Self-deception. You see, you might justify yourself, but you kind of know you were wrong. And then you move to self-deception. I am right. 
And then you find more and more reasons to build yourself up into being right. And finally, you're just self-absorbed. Everything's about you. Whatever you hear is about you. The Bible teacher says something, it has to be about you and you only. Oh, it's not the group. It has to be about you and you only. Why? Because you're arrogant. As a result, conflict. So therefore, self-justification, self-deception, and self-absorption keeps people from the filling of the Spirit. And that is the power of the spiritual life. And Satan does the same thing through his strategy. Tries to keep you from being filled with the Spirit. Number three. And this is what happens. It's kind of a result. Number three is a result of number two. Number one, again, was through negative volition toward the teaching of the Word of God and Bible doctrine. This is Satan's strategy to keep you from post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation. Through negative volition toward the teaching of the Word. Number two, so that you'll be out of fellowship with there's, where there's no filling of God the Holy Spirit. Number three, through getting the believer to understand doctrine academically rather than spiritually. Through getting the believer to understand doctrine academically rather than spiritually. Is that possible? You bet your life it's possible. Satan's strategy is to get people to understand doctrine academically rather than spiritually. You may run into somebody someday who seems to know a lot of doctrine academically, yet they're the devil's servant. And the only thing they ever do is try to cause problems and they try to stir up things. Well, what do you do about it? Leave them in the Lord's hands. Nothing. But there are people who understand a lot of doctrine academically, but they're not filled with the Spirit. They are too busy trying to make other people's lives miserable. Trying to. I emphasize trying. Leave them in the Lord's hands. They're already miserable. Believe me. But they understand it academically. And they could spout off all sorts of stuff academically. Oh, they could, they could even... Uh, they, Memorize parts of Scripture. Do you know that uh, the Apostle Paul, as an unbeliever, Saul of Tarsus, memorized the entire Old Testament? He could have quoted to you the entire Old Testament. That's academic knowledge. He was an unbeliever! And that was all academic knowledge. Apparently, when he became a believer, he began to forget some of those things that he had memorized in the Old Testament. I only say that because he took a vow one time, and we'll study that in Acts. I'm getting ahead of myself. But he took a vow in Acts, and he did not follow the correct procedure of taking a vow as illustrated in the Old Testament. Yet he had memorized the Old Testament. How could he have made such a mistake? Well, at that point, he was a believer and outside of fellowship. That's exactly how he made such a mistake. But you can know doctrine academically and it means nothing. Absolutely nothing. Unless it has been metabolized and has uh, become your spirituality through the filling of the Spirit. Number four. Through hindering the circulation of doctrine in the stream of consciousness. Number four. Satan's strategy for the believer in hindering is to is through this, through hindering the circulation of doctrine in the stream of consciousness. Through hindering the circulation of doctrine in the stream of consciousness. How does that happen? Garbage. Garbage in the stream of consciousness. What is that garbage, satanic doctrine? Oftentimes, for the abused child, it's all the garbage they picked up in childhood. And the satanic strategy? If you want to know the truth, he would wish every child abused. Because that builds up the fastest garbage in the stream of consciousness. It's unbelievable how fast the garbage builds up for an abused child and, they, and it becomes extraordinarily difficult to flush it out and uh, 
such abused children may become positive and that's their only hope their only hope is to become positive otherwise their lives are terrible and they have what is called the millstone transfer they actually transfer the millstone that was put on the abuser's neck to their own neck and they drown themselves in the cosmic system but remember God is fair and he gives everyone a fair shake and that person who is abused will have a fair shake to come out of or out from that abuse and to uh, become a wonderful believer even but they're gonna have a lot of garbage to flush out and what's it gonna take the filling of God the Holy Spirit plus consistent post salvation epistemological rehabilitation meaning constant learning of the Word of God maybe even more than one hour a day we have set one hour a day as the standard and that's I get that's fine as long as you remain filled with the spirit and are applying what you hear an hour a day we really have no way of knowing how long our Lord Jesus Christ taught in the garden maybe two hours maybe three maybe four maybe he talked till they fell asleep and then left who knows we don't know there's no way we can know but we go on the standard of one hour and one hour a day you're doing much better than most <laughs> believe me one hour a day would be for some people that's a chore and learning the word of God should never ever be a chore now it might start out that way I can understand you're, because when you first start out the only thing the Bible is going to do is step on your toes constantly why you're a baby believer and everything you do is going to be like don't touch this don't touch that what are you doing are you stupid why are you doing this why are you doing that why because babies do stupid stuff like put uh, things in electrical outlets I did that as a kid you put things like metal things you just uh, stick them in a little electrical out that's stupid somebody comes along and says don't do that and the little kid gets rebellious and says don't tell me what to do <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the way believers are especially starting out and they might uh, get a stiff neck and say don't tell me what to do then they get shocked back to reality it might take a while, especially if there's a lot of garbage in the stream of consciousness. It might take years to flush that out. But you flush it out through humility. And there are some people who have that humility and know they're wrong. Oh, they might in their mind say, I'm right. And they might go home and brood over it. And they might be mad, but they would never, ever make an issue out of it to someone else. In other words, they have the humility to keep their mouth shut. If you don't like it, shut your mouth. Period. And you don't even have to come back. If, you, if somebody, if you're watching a television show and you don't like it, what is the logical thing to do? Change the channel. Yet there are some weirdos who don't like the show and just want to cuss at it all the time. Stupidest thing I've ever seen. Let's see what else stupid they'll do. I've watched shows like that too. And I've actually watched a whole stupid show before all the way through. But it's stupid when you could be watching something better. It's all a matter of your choice. And some people are too stupid to make a choice, so they get arrogant. So then the one in authority has to make a choice for them. So you're too arrogant. Bye. Bye bye. You're too arrogant. You cannot, uh, you do not understand authority. You despise my youth, etc jealousy all that junk and so out the door you should have gone long ago on your own volition but instead because of garbage in the stream of consciousness through the development of cosmic thinking and all of that in the stream of consciousness people get a stiff neck through that uh, all of that junk in the stream of consciousness from child abuse and everything else and they're going to show somebody something. They're going to be a tough person. Somebody told me they, that they can hear subliminal messages from my message. And they said, I can 
Uh, when you say certain things, I know exactly who you're talking about. Cuckoo. Absolutely cuckoo. You don't know who I'm talking about. Oh, you might have an idea here and there, but you have no clue. So I never say names. Now, I could if I wanted to. Apostle Paul himself said, watch out for Demas. Apostle Paul himself said, watch out for so-and-so and so-and-so and stay away from them because they're trying to drag down the church. I have a right as a pastor teacher to tell you to watch out for, but I avoid it because I want to make sure I'm in the right and I try to avoid punishment. I want to make sure I'm right before I would ever issue that against anyone. And the Apostle Paul knew he was right. I have a little ways to go. <coughs> I'm not going to issue names because I just don't think it's important. Especially with such a small church, it's not important at all. It's dinky. It's stupid. This is all about doctrine. Why else would I be up here? I could have a job making money. Why else would I be up here? Because I love teaching doctrine and that's my gift. So, through hindering the circulation of the doctrine in the stream of consciousness through the hardness of heart or the hardening of the stream of consciousness through garbage in the stream of consciousness. And again, there are two different types. There are people who have garbage in the stream of consciousness who are humble enough to say, I'm willing to flush it all out. And those people I love very much. Those people who say, I'm going to stick it out and I'm going to flush this out. No, I'm not perfect, and I know I got these hang-ups, but I'm going to flush out these hang-ups. And when the pastor brings up my hang-up, I'm not going to be hypersensitive about it. I'm just going to say to myself, you know, that's right, from Scripture, and I need to flush that out. Then there are others who have hang-ups, and they get upset and want to make an issue out of it. That just doesn't work. Somebody else also told me that... Uh, we had a terrible uh, that he's well, you let the phone ring during Bible class you let people walk in and out during Bible class well not anymore we have the most well behaved people ever <laughs> and it's much better much nicer have well behaved people who are actually listening and not fiddling with this and that and hopping up and down and jumping around unreal so continuing number one two three four five number five through the sin nature and the garbage from the subconscious of the soul Satan attacks through the old sin nature and the garbage from the subconscious of the soul Satan tries to control the believer through the old sin nature by tempting the believer to commit sin and perform good deeds. One or the other. Believers are distracted into thinking that simple morality is the Christian way of life. If you got nothing else, just get that. Believers are, are distracted into thinking that simple morality is the Christian way of life. And people I've taught for a year and a half still acted like morality was the Christian way of life. Somebody told me I shouldn't say that. Well, don't listen if you don't like it. <laughs> Stupid. Dummy. Insignificant peon. That's what I think. And I can say that. If that's the way you think. If that's the way you think and you're mad now, well, then you are a stupid, insignificant peon. Turn in, uh, well, let's look at one more. One, two, three, four, five, six. Listen to all the people laughing at you. Oh, that's a beautiful sound. Number six. And you're probably still listening, which means you are definitely a moron. People are laughing at you, and you're still listening. Some people say, oh, that pastor's out of fellowship. No, I'm not. I'm trying to make a point. The point is authority. You either you can listen and shut up about it, or you can listen and make big hay about it, and if you want to make a big hay about it, well, right back at you, buddy. Keep la Laugh out loud. It's fun. Betty's still listening. Number six. 
he or she or it. Number six, all the strategies of Satan are directed toward the free will of mankind and not the sovereignty of God. All the strategies of Satan are directed toward the free will of mankind and not the sovereignty of God. I bet some people think I am out of fellowship. Why are you going in that direction? I'm doing it purposely. You see, the authority has the pastor, and it, the the pastor has the authority, and it it, is, it should not be challenged. Period. And if people want to challenge the authority, do not listen. Leave. And I say these certain things to keep you from hearing the same crap I hear. And to keep you actually protected from hearing the same crap I hear. And it has nothing to... It has to do with establishing an authority. And sometimes you've got to be tough to do it. And it has nothing to do with being out of fellowship. I have no hard feelings toward absolutely anyone. But it has to do with the fact there must be an air of authority around the pastor. And the problem... Now, the colonel never had a problem with that because he established his authority. And when you first start out, you're going to have a problem with it, especially if you're young, because people despise you because of your youth. And they think, what do you know? A lot more than you, because I'm a pastor teacher, and, well, that I've been graced out. So I do. So just shut up and listen, or go somewhere else and leave me alone. That is establishing authority. And I could... <laughs> and what does it matter, anyway? What does it matter? 2 Corinthians 2.11 2 Corinthians 2.11 This states the general principle. Bet that idiot's still listening. 2 Corinthians 2.11 Well, if he can keep listening after that, he or she, he might make it. He or she might make it. 2 Corinthians 2.11 Then I won't laugh at you anymore. And this states the general principle. Hold your ground against the devil. Satan. Hold your... Is that not what it says? Have I lost my, my mind? I say collective mind because I have probably more than most. I'm just joking. I can teach with one half my brain tied behind my back and still do better than everybody else. What, what Was it a wrong passage that I gave out or not? It says, and I say that she's taken the hand you us, for we are not ignorant. Well, forget that and turn to James 4, 6. <laughs> James 4, 6. Now, Satan's strategy is to keep the believer in the cosmic system. And the best way to do that is through arrogance! And what does arrogance do? It bows its neck at authority, pastoral authority especially. And people were bowing their neck at James. And James eventually fell into it and said, I can't handle this anymore. And he went the way of the cosmic system along with them. It's James 4, 6. 4, 6 through 8. James 4, 6 through 8. But He gives us more grace. That is why Scripture says, God opposes the proud, the arrogant, but gives grace to the humble. Verse 7. Submit yourselves then to God. Now people could walk around and say, I submit myself to God, but it's not true. How do you submit yourself to God? Through the learning of the Word of God, post-salvation, epistemological rehabilitation. By sitting down and listening to a pastor, your right pastor, no matter what his personality, no matter how much it steps on your toes, and keep your mouth shut and listen, period. So you humble yourself by doing that. Submit yourselves then to God. And then you'll resist the devil. If you are arrogant, you've fallen into his system and you're done for. And he's not going to follow you anywhere. 
I've per heard people who should know better. Oh, the devil's after me. The devil doesn't know you. The devil doesn't know me. The devil has a system by which he does not have to go around from person to person. And his system is a one in which everyone can get caught up in it as soon as they fall into arrogance. Why? They are mimicking the first sin, Satan's sin. And when I talk about the authority of the pastor teacher, how many of you would ever go up to your boss and, and, and tell him how to do things? Well, there are a few arrogant people who would, and guess what happens to them? They get fired! He is the boss. He is the authority. I've seen people who got anti-authority with the boss, and the boss said, all right, we're coming in on Saturday. We need some things to be done. And the guy got mad and said, I had plans. I understand the man's frustration. But either way, he got mad, and he went up to the boss and said, I got plans tomorrow. My family's made plans, and you just now announced it, which was stupid of him as a boss and wrong, I would think. But either way, he's the boss and the authority. Now, I didn't want to work Saturday any more than this guy did, but I was going to do it anyway. So he made a big issue out of it, and the boss said, Well, you don't have to show up again then. You know what he did? I'll be in tomorrow. I'll be in as soon as the doors are open, and I'll be here, and, and I'm going to work on Saturday. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, authority. Plus, he wanted that money. But suddenly, when authority put its foot down and said, Well, that's fine. You don't have to come. You don't ever have to come back. Guess what? There was some enforced humility. And my boss wasn't wrong even for saying that. And you might say, Well, should have told him in advance. Maybe so. But so what? He's still the authority. And authority's not always right, but there's still the authority. So he worked on Saturday. And the same thing applies to the pastor in that he has authority. And whenever the pastor wants to hold Bible class, that is his choice. And whenever it ends, that is his choice. And what he wants to teach is his choice. People used to try to tell the colonel, thing, well, you, when you get into Revelation, when you get into this and that, it's the wrong thing to ask that man. You think I'm out of fellowship. You don't know what my pastor would do. And, he, and oftentimes he was not out of fellowship. James 4, 6 through 8. Maybe a couple of times he was, but whose business is that? James 4, 6 through 8. But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Verse 7. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. How do you resist the devil? Post-salvation, epistemological rehabilitation, through submission to the authority of a pastor teacher, teaching the word of God. That is how you resist the devil. How do you fall into his schemes? By being arrogant. Verse 8. Come near to God and he will come near to you. That is rebound to be in fellowship. Wash your hands, you sinners. Also a reference to rebound, just a repetition. And pur purify your hearts. That is the garbage in your stream of consciousness. Purify your hearts. We also noted purify, katharizo, from 1 John 1, 9, purification from the cosmic system. When you name your sins, you plop out of the cosmic system. Purify your hearts here refers to the fact you purify your stream of consciousness through post-salvation, epistemological rehabilitation. You grow in grace and in knowledge, and all of that arrogant garbage gets pushed out, and that arrogant garbage stinks to high heaven, and you don't even know it till you push it out. Then you look back on your life and you say, Whew, I sure am glad I got that stuff out of there. Because it's stinky. Especially the, to those who know anything. Then it goes on to say, You double-minded psychotic. Fastest way to go psychotic is to ignore authority. Reject authority. Young men who reject authority usually end up in psychosis. 
Same goes for young ladies, especially the young ladies who reject authority. They go into psychosis because now they don't know how to respond to their right man. They don't know how to respond to anything. So usually they go into nymphomania, drugs, and everything else. Ruin their lives and go into disukos. And they become double-minded, psychotic. And when you become double-minded, it is saying what you must do is rebound, then purify your heart. Now the verse makes it seem easy, but that's not easy at all once you reach that state. You are in a state of psychosis, and you're positive. It will take years and years and years to recover years. God will give you the time. He's gracious, but it will take a long time. And it will take a positive volition on your part and a change of mind not to be rebellious anymore, but now to be humble. You know what the problem with these United States is? The people of the United States lack humility. They are constantly bulking heads with authority. Constantly. Now authority is not always right. I as your authority may not always be right. That is as the authority of the church. Outside of the, this pulpit there is none. But I'm talking about as the authority in, in, in the church. There is, when you start to rebel against authority that's it for you. If I'm not your right pastor, go to your right pastor. Listen to your right pastor. And don't buck heads with him. Kind of hard to do so with some of them today because they are, they've left behind a legacy. Maybe that's the best way for some arrogant people to go. Just go along with that legacy left behind because then you can't cause trouble. So you won't care. Nobody will care because you'll just be barking at yourself. But the fact is, authority is what people in this country have really gone against ever since the 1960s, and it hasn't changed. If anything, it has deepened and gotten worse. You go to foreign countries. I've talked to people that's been to foreign countries, and they always come back and talk about how the people were humble. That's because they had never seen such humility toward authority. That is, the children, they do something wrong and they get a whack and they say, well, these are the best acting children I've ever seen in the world, excuse me, right here from this country. Well, in some countries, well, they're growing up under humility and they understand something about authority even though in many of those countries it's mainly unbelievers. Europeans look at this country and say we're spoiled. Well, while they're not much better off than we are, in fact, a lot worse off than we are, they're right. Spoiled. And they look at our children and say, your children are spoiled. They're right. We're a country that's been prospered beyond what any country in the world has ever been prospered before. And a lot of that has led to arrogance this prosperity and all the things that we have in this United States of entertainment has led to a great deal of, well, a lot of people feel entitled to it. I remember after the hurricane in New Orleans, people thought they were entitled. And they, and they were complaining, we li we're living like we're in a third world country, they would say. We don't deserve this, they would say. What makes you any better than someone in a third world country? Except the fact that you've been graced out to live in a client nation. And you wait. You just wait when this country begins to fall apart. You just wait and you see how the American people will act. They will act arrogant. Very arrogant. And if it gets really bad, you better hold up yourself in the house and have some guns ready. I'm serious about that. And things could get extraordinarily bad 
But God has graced us out because there are few humble and a few in this country that have gone to play Roma. More so than in other countries, but just a few. And it's holding us together as a nation. We're falling apart, though. If all of us live a normal lifetime, every one of you in here included, if all of us live to a normal ripe old age, we will see the fall of this nation unless there's a revival. We will. There's no way around it. All you have to do is know a little bit about Scripture. Some people don't know anything about Scripture and know about history and they say the same things. We're in trouble. But we can turn it around. Even a few people can turn it around by growing in grace and knowledge and having humility. But instead of having humility, some people just want to start fights and some people just want to uh, go around and have something to talk about and they want to go around and talk about nonsense, nonsense things that don't even matter. That don't matter now and they definitely won't matter in eternity. And they want to get huffy and they want to get mad. It's time to put that behind you. It's time to uh, throw that old sin nature away. Be filled with the Spirit. Oh, it'll come back. And you'll sin, and you'll gossip, you'll malign, you'll judge, you'll do something stupid. Rebound and keep moving. Grow in the grace and in the knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Move to play Roma to that ooh. It's the only thing that's going to save this country. No president can. We're beyond any point of that. No president could in the first place. It all depended upon the pivot, of which we have none. We have play Roma. And very few at that. And I'm not there yet either. So we all need to plug along. And how do you do it? Humility. Come near to God and He will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. And purify your hearts from the garbage in the stream of consciousness. And that is the only way. Because most believers walk around thinking morality is the Christian way of life and it is not. It's spirituality. And I've taught people and they've never come to understand it. I've taught people face to face, although they may have only come every other day, so what? I've taught them face to face and said spirituality is the filling of the Spirit. Nah, it's morality. Got to act this way, got to act that way. You can't say this, you can't say that. As a result, we're in deep, deep trouble. We need a revival, not only of unbelievers, but mainly of believers, to grow in grace and in knowledge. But it's not happening. And even those who claim they are, are being led astray by something, by the devil and his system. These are tragic times we live in. Not good times. They can be good times for you with spiritual life. But for most people, tragedy after tragedy will hit. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May we come to understand what humility is all about. May we come to understand what spirituality is all about. May we come to understand what it means to flush out the garbage in our stream of consciousness. May we come to understand what double-mindedness is all about and how to recover from such a terrible situation. In whose name we ask it, amen.